This is John Lanza and this is the top complete behind the scenes coverage of the Beatles in America by the fifth Beatle, Ed Rudy. This is one of the original four Beatles, John Lennon, saying thank you for the wonderful reception we've received in the United States and stay tuned for Ed Rudy's reports and as we tour the States. Okay, Ed. This is the audio story of the Beatles in America, a radio news documentary produced through the facilities of Radio Pulse Beat News. Here is the sound and substance of the world's hottest entertainment group. This is Ed Rudy reporting for Radio Pulse Beat News with the Beatles' American Tour. This is George Harrison of the Beatles saying, stay tuned for Ed Rudy's exclusive coverage of our American tour. We want the Beatles! We want the Beatles! We want the Beatles! We want the Beatles! This is Paul McCartney of the Beatles saying, stay tuned for Ed Rudy's exclusive coverage of our American tour. There were thousands of fans on hand as the Beatles arrived at Kennedy International Airport in New York. We asked some of them why they were there. How old are you? I am 18 and a half. And where do you go to school? I go to City College, <laughs> and I want to welcome the Beatles to New York on behalf of City College and Tau Epsilon Phi. Hey! Hey! How, how old are you? 19. What do you think of the Beatles? They are great, amazing, fantastic. What makes them great? Oh, they are, they are tremendous. The music. How old are you? I'm 16. Why are you here? Because uh, everybody else is here. I don't know. Did you cut school to come down here? No, we have half day. You have I half a day off? Yeah. I cut school. What do you think of the Beatles? I think they're great. I really what do you think of I think they're fabulous. We're from Arkansas. You're from Arkansas. The Beatles. You came up from Arkansas. Oh, that's right. Last Tuesday morning, sir. How old are you? 18 years old. Hey! What? Are you, are you from school in Arkansas? Yeah, University of Arkansas, Fayetteville. And you came up here just for the Beatles? Yes, sir, that's right. We come from Clifton. What do you think of the Beatles? Oh, they're okay. More than, I want to come see excitement more than anything else. Right. Okay. How, old How old are you? How old are you? 16. Where are you from? Elmont, Long Island. Okay. We love the Beatles. We love the Beatles. We love the Beatles. You can hear for two hours. The Beatles' first American news conference was a complete success, and they parried every verbal thrust of the American newsmen. One of the first questions that we asked them was, are you embarrassed by the Beatlemania, the near lunacy that you create? And they answered. No, it's great. We like lunatics. Yeah, it's healthy. We then relayed a request from a young gal reporter in the room who wanted to hear them sing a song. In unison, they replied. No. <laughs> Sorry. Next question. No, we need money first. <laughs> How much money do you expect to take out of this country? Uh, about half a crown, two dollars. Depends on the tax. We then told the Beatles that it had been alleged that they were nothing but four Elvis Presleys, and they replied. He must be blind. It's not true. It's not true. <laughs> 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 Their long mop tops inspired us to ask if they ever got haircuts. Nope. No, no, no. I had one yesterday. <laughs> and that's no lie. That's the truth. truth. Honest, that's it. You know, I think he missed. No? No, he didn't, no. You should have seen him the day before. <laughs> okay, he's one here. We got a rather surprising reply where we asked the Beatles how they accounted for their phenomenal success. If we knew, we'd form another group and be managers. <laughs> 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 the next question was, why do you sing like Americans and speak like Englishmen? That is English, uh, actually. It's not English, it's Liverpoolian, you see. Well, the, yeah. Liverpool, the Liverpool accent, so the way you say some of the words, you know, you say grass instead of grass. Grass? Well, that sounds a bit American. So there you go. Well, Liverpool's anyway, it sells better. The capital R. <laughs> We then asked the Liverpudlian lads if they had heard of the Stamp Out the Beatle campaign being organized by a group of Detroit students and exactly what they intended to do about it. First of all, we're bringing out the Stamp Out Detroit campaign. Which, you know... Seriously, what do you intend to do about this Stamp Out the Beatle campaign? What about it? Do you think it'll have any How concern? big are they? Well, it's... <laughs> <laughs> But we're on your side. What do you think of Beethoven? Great. Especially his poems. 
keep cracking up during the day. Before we packed up our microphones at the airport, we asked the lyrical Liverpudlian lads exactly when they felt they were going to retire. Next week. I don't know. No, we're probably no. not. We're going to keep going as long as we can. When we get fed up with it, you know, we're still enjoying it now. Any minute now. No. No, as long as we enjoy it, we'll do it. Because we enjoyed it before we made any money. From the airport, they went to the Hotel Plaza in New York City. Outside of the hotel, we spoke to some of the many, many teenagers who were there assembled. <laughs> There are a bunch of teenagers here in front of the Hotel Plaza, right across the street where the police have chased them, and it's raining now. Why, why are you out here at this time? They're upstairs, right over there. What the hell is at the window. Look, there he is at the window. Who, who's at the window? I think it's Ringo. Ringo, I know what. Because he's short. There he is. Look at him. I swear. There he is. Hey, and you're standing here in the rain just take a look at that. I don't care about the Beatles. It's now a blizzard. I don't care. Well, what, what makes the uh, Beatles so great? Why are you standing here? I like right? the way they sing. You like the way they sing? How about their haircuts? Uh, I think they're real great, you know? They're 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 great. Great. The hair's what makes them. It distinguishes them from all others. <laughs> <laughs> One of the prime reasons the Beatles came to America was to appear on the Ed Sullivan Show. And that, again, was a complete victory. The show received its highest ratings ever. While in New York, they managed to dine at the Posh 21 Club, go twisting at the Peppermint Lounge, and tour Greenwich Village and rented Hertz limousines. They also enjoyed the attention of the bunnies at the Playboy Club. During a break in the schedule, Radio Pulse Beat News microphones were on hand as we spoke with Beatle Road Manager Malcolm Evans. Have you been down to the Peppermint Lounge yet? I haven't been down, or the boys have been. Yeah, I know, I know that they were there, and I know that they met a couple of young ladies there, one of the fellows was telling me. Uh, they haven't had, actually had any uh, chance to develop any real friendships uh, with gals since they've been in New York, or since they've been in America, really, have they? Oh, no. Life's been a bit too hectic since they've been here with press conferences, photograph sessions, you know, and we're not rehearsing for shows and traveling, you know. We don't get much time for romance. The Washington, D.C. Coliseum booked the Beatles for a one-night stand in the indoor stadium. They went down by train, and reaction at Union Station was so fantastic that our audio transmission equipment was smashed as we made the following narration. We're going through Union Station now with the Beatle Party. There are thousands, literally thousands and thousands of teenagers, and they're mobbing the whole party. The police are being perhaps a little unnecessarily rough. Not with the teenagers, but with the members of the official Beatle Party, including Washington and New York Press. <laughs> We're walking under a sign saying, Welcome Beatles to Washington. Must be about five feet high and 20 feet across. It was at this point that our broadcast lines broke. In any case, it was a sellout performance at the Washington Coliseum long before the actual performance. 9,000 Beatlemania-afflicted fans screamed and stamped so loud and for so long that the din was indescribable. We asked Beatle John Lennon about his reaction to their enthusiasm. Try and play it. What normally happens is that when sort of the girls are screaming, though, people notice it more. I think, you know, that it's a different kind of audience reaction to the one you normally get. So everybody sort of points this out more. But it, it definitely helps to, to swing a show along if the audience is going like a bump, like it was last night. We enjoy it, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's the, it's the young people's way of showing their appreciation. We love it. Ringo Starr told us of their plans for next year. We go to Australia, and we go to Israel, and... Um, South Africa next year, and we also have a holiday. In fact, this was a holiday till we got booked for America. After the concert in Washington, there was a reception for the Beatles at the British Embassy in the capital. It was a costume ball, and the Major General attached to the Embassy staff actually donned a Beatle wig and mask to everyone's amusement. Embassy press attaché Frank Mitchell was quizzed by Radio Pulse Beat News correspondent Bill Healy on the Beatle reception at the staid British Embassy. I think they're, uh, I, I think they're, they're fine. I, I think they're a riot. <laughs> I know that they've given me more work to do than I've had at any time since the Queen of England was here seven years ago. Mr. Mitchell, I know you're a diplomat. Can I tell you sort of a diplomatic curve? Means? One wit said that the Beatles were the British payment for the Skyboat. 
You think there's any validity in that? No, I wouldn't say they're the British payment for the sky bolt. No, no, let me, let us say they're the British payment for all that spam you sent us during the war. At the British Embassy party in Washington, we asked Ringo if he considered himself the sex symbol of the Beatles. Ringo, you've been called the sex symbol of the Beatles. Why? Joking. Oh, I've never heard in my life be lying. No, I'm... <laughs> Do you consider yourself a sex symbol in no, any... No, not at all. You, you can see me. You know I'm no sex symbol. Can you see my face? At the British Embassy, along with reporter Bill Healy, we asked Ringo Starr if he anticipated the fantastic reception he had received in America. We never expected anything like this, you know. How do you compare this to, to your European receptions? Um... It's pretty similar to England. It was different in France because the 78% of the boys were um, boys, you know, of the audience. <laughs> Hello, Robbie. Uh, why were 78% of the audience boys? Because only 24% were girls. 22% were girls. <laughs> <laughs> Is this your pen? 22%. I've made a mistake. One for next little oh, Thank you. Ringo, do you like all this attention? Um, no, it doesn't write. I like it when I'm on stage. <laughs> <laughs> the Beatles returned to New York for their doubleheader concert at world-famed Carnegie Hall. It was a huge success, with thousands being turned away. You can judge the success from this crowd reaction after the show. They're really alive. Great show. They put on a great show. They really worked very hard, and they put on a really spectacular show. You we were all jumping around and carrying on. They're great. They really are. They're really great. What makes them great? The talent. They've got a lot of talent. They've got a gimmick. That's what did it, I think. They've got a gimmick? What, what do they do that's different from other performers? They don't take themselves so seriously. They have fun. They make more money. For sure. They've got a lot of presence on the stage. They really act as though they belong there and know what they're doing. They're not too impressed with themselves. No, they aren't. They, take, they don't take themselves so seriously. And they're so casual. Yeah. They're really casual about the whole thing. Hello, this is Malcolm Evans, road manager of the Beatles, saying stay tuned to Ed Rudy's complete coverage of the Beatles. The Beatles flew to Miami Beach for their only other American commitment, another Ed Sullivan show emanating from the Deauville Hotel. The exuberance of their greetings at New York and Washington, D.C. did not compare to the wild scene that welcomed the Beatles at Miami International Airport. Screeching, screaming, and squirming teenagers broke through barricades and wreaked havoc as they tried to reach their idols. Windows were smashed, doors broken, and chairs demolished. A police escort was needed to allow for safe passage of the two limousines carrying the Beatle party to the Deauville. Several teenagers were injured in the Beatle front battle, but none of these casualties suffered any serious wounds. The warm weather affected the Beatles in the same way that it affects most everyone else, and they seemed pleasure bent. Paul McCartney describes a typical day in Miami as Radio Pulse Beat News picked this up. We went out on, the, on a yacht today, you know, we sort of bathed around a bit. Very good at this. Road manager Malcolm Evans elucidates on another Beatle day. After the rehearsals in the afternoon, they went to a private swimming pool, they did a bit of swimming, and in the evening, the police sergeant, who was in charge of the security for the boys, invited them to his home for dinner, and the boys were really glad to accept, you know, and sample some American cooking, home cooking. We asked Paul McCartney what plans they had while in Miami, and this is what he answered. Uh, get a bit of sun, try and get healthy. While in Miami, they spent much of their time on private boats and relaxing and had so much fun that they extended their stay for an additional four days. In order to do this, the Beatles actually had to stand up the Prime Minister of Great Britain. They missed the luncheon appointment with Lord Hume in order to remain in the States for a few more days. We asked Beatle Road Manager Neil Aspinall how they felt about their reaction in the United States, and he told us. Marvelous, you know, you know, well, we've never had anything like it before, you know. Uh, has the weather been anything of a surprise to you? No, we thought it was going to be like this, but, you know, I think it still was a surprise anyway, you know. Have uh, the reaction of the crowds throughout the country, uh, here in Miami and Washington, New York, surprised you at all? Yeah, they have. we didn't think it was going to be anything like as big as it was. We flew back to New York with the Beatles and sat with Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, John Lennon, George Harrison, and press and road managers Brian Somerville and Neil Aspinall. Here is how the conversation sounded aboard the Beatle plane. This is Ed Rudy about the Beetle plane now departing Miami International Airport for New York. 
How long after we land in New York will you be leaving for London? Uh, half an hour after we land, we'll be flying out again. Yeah, well, that's pretty fast. And, and will that include the press conference and all? Yeah, that'll include the press conference as well. While you were in the United States, what sort of reaction did you get wherever you went? It was great, you know. And, uh, it, it, are you anxious to return? Pardon? Are you, are you anxious to return here? Yeah, but we got, you know, we're booked up in sort of Europe with engagements and things, so it'll be a long time before we can get back. It has the reaction of the crowds, the teenagers and adults been very similar uh, to what you've experienced in Europe prior to coming here? Yeah, very similar to what's happened, what happens to us in England, particularly, you know, not so much the rest of Europe, but England definitely. You know, it's just great, you know, the big crowds and all that, you know. I, I'm rather surprised that uh, nothing unique at all, not, nothing that made you laugh, nothing funny. No, sort of hundreds of funny things have happened, but, you know, I just can't think of any sort of one at the moment, you know. How about, apart from things, be, about things being unique, well, everything in the States has been sort of unique to us all, you know. How about the kids trying to break into the, what I like to call the uh, Beatles Sweetle? <laughs> over at the uh, uh, three different hotels that you stated. Yeah, well, they do that in England as well, you know, so we're sort of quite used to that. But we were sort of well protected over here in the States yeah. by the police and things, you know, so none of them got through. I, I was talking to uh, the police captain, or actually the chief of police, and he told me you received the exact same type of protection that a visiting potentate or chief of state receives if uh, de Gaulle or the uh, Queen of England came to the United States, uh, they would receive no more or less protection than the Beatles did. Oh, well, we didn't know this. He didn't tell us that, you know. But, I don't know. What can you say, you know? Well, that, that, that's pretty unique in itself. Uh, I, did, were any of the kids actually able to uh, break through the police guard and get to any of the fellows? No, none of them did. Not at any point? Not at any point at all. Some of them tried, you know, some of the ideas they come up with are marvellous, you know. And often if the idea is sort of good enough, you know, we'll say, you know, if you've got the brains to think up something like that, we're going to see them, you know. No, I uh, know that some kids climbed over a seawall in the back of the Doville, very high, in order just to get into the hotel. And they were nowhere near you anyway, but they really went to the trouble of climbing over this great big high seawall just to maybe get a chance to look at the Beatles. Isn't that fantastic? I, I imagine that, that would kind of thrill all of the fellows. Well, this is the first we've heard of it, you know. And it is, you know, it is good, but kids were doing that type of thing all the way through, you know. We flew back to New York with the Beatles as the only American newsman to complete the entire Beatle tour. As they entered their London-bound flight at New York's Kennedy International Airport, Ringo acted as spokesman for the group, and this was their final statement in America. Oh, it's fantastic again, you know, it's marvelous. A great, you know, it's a marvelous place. We hope to come back as soon as we can. We did, however, manage to record a telephone conversation with Beatle George Harrison, and he gave us a great many inside facts and interesting information about the Beatles. This is John Lennon of the Beatles saying, stay tuned for Ed Rooley's exclusive coverage of our American tour. Stay tuned, kids. Ed Rudy, this is one of the original four Beatles, George Harrison, saying thank you for the wonderful reception we've received in the United States. And stay tuned for Ed Rudy's report. What do you think of the reception that you've gotten in America so far? It's fabulous, you know, it's knocked us out. It's great. You know, it's, you know, we never expected anything like this. It's been too good. Uh, did you expect so many people in America to be Beatles fans? No, not at all. I mean, we'd heard, well, well, that our records were selling well, but, you know, when we, it wasn't until we stepped off the plane, you know, and there were thousands of kids there to meet us, you know, we we didn't really realize that, you know, we were just so well known over here. Yeah, it, it was quite a scene. Uh, incidentally, can you personally uh, account for the phenomenal popularity of the group? What what quality uh, uh, gives this uh, fantastic popularity? I don't know. It's it, you know, it's hard to say. You know, in fact, as we said at the reception at the airport, if we did 
now, then we'd probably form another group and we'd be the managers. <laughs> you know, that, that's sort of true, really, because you, you just can't say. It's probably a lot of things. That I, I think it's sort of got to do with our songs, uh, sort of original songs, and we, the, the overall sound on record is a bit new. So, and the people, I think, were ready for, you know, to have something new. And then, you know, we're all look, we look funny and funny hair and that, and, you know, sort of all added up to, to make the whole thing so big. But, you know, you can't really pinpoint one thing and say that's why we're big. Yeah, I, I can see that. I imagine it's more the uh, sound than anything else. Can you uh, give me some sort of a definition or a, a description of what, what the Beatles sound is or the Liverpool sound? Well, we don't like the saying Liverpool sound, actually. You know, because uh, the only reason it was called the Liverpool sound was uh, because the British press, and that when they decided it was a different sound, and they didn't think it was rock and roll, and they didn't think it was rhythm and blues, and you know how they've always got to call it something, they've got to have a name for it, so they sort of decided to call it this, the Liverpool sound, which sort of caught on. But you know, we don't think it's a really different enough sound. Uh, for, uh, you know, as far as we were concerned, we started off just playing the old rock and roll stuff, and it just so happens it comes out like that. Right. Uh, in uh, talking about the Beatles sound, it brings me to the next question. Where did the name Beatles come from? Uh, well, we, all, we were thinking of a name a long time ago for the group, you know, and uh, we were just racking our brains for names, and John came up with this the name Beatles, and it was good because it was sort of the insect, and then it also was a pun, you know, B-A-T, on the beat, so, you know, we just liked the name, and we kept it. Yes. Uh, incidentally, if it seems strange that I don't answer you, I'm trying to uh, get you as clear as possible without interrupting you. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I'm listening. Don't think I've gone away. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, why do you wear your hair uh, in such an unusual style? Um... Well, we've always liked it long. Uh, even when we were at school, we, you know, the headmaster used to shout at us. The principal, you call him over there, used to shout at us for having our hair long. But, um, you know, we, we had it back and to the side and forward and up and down and all sorts of ways. But about three years ago, Paul and John went to Paris for a holiday and they tried to get the French cut, but it didn't work out, you know, and it... It ended up like this, and I went to the swimming baths. When I came out, and when it, my hair dried out, it was just all forward like like a mop. So I, le I, I liked it, so I left it like that. And then, you know, when Ringo joined the group, we, we got him to get his hair like it. Because by then, it, you know, people sort of were calling it the beetle cut. I, I see. Uh, is this uh, rather prevalent in England now? Are there many kids wearing this style? Do yeah. adults wear it? Yeah, well, you see, um, that's the main difference between the kids over here and in England, you see. In England, there's two lots of kids. There's the, the rockers and the mods. That's what they, they, they're called. And the rockers are sort of the people with the old haircut, like the Tony Curtis style. And uh, they wear winkle picker shoes and zip-up leather jackets. And they're the rockers. And then the, uh, the people who are the mods, who are sort of dressed like us, and have the hair forward, and that they're supposed to be the with it ones, and the rockers are supposed to be the old fashioned ones. But over, over here in the States, you know, this mod bit hasn't caught on yet, you know, and everybody's still sort of a rocker. <laughs> yeah, and rocker uh, kind of means square, doesn't it? Well, I mean, uh, I, I don't really mean that the people over here aren't really square, it's just, uh, if they went to England, they'd be called a rocker, you see, because because of the way they dress and the way they have their hair. I mean, this is only the teenagers, I'm not talking about older people. Right. Uh, do you find that you have any uh, problems or special difficulties due to the unusual haircut and the very distinctive clothing that you wear? Yeah, well, it makes... Uh, us, um, you know, people can sort of pick us out easier. 
and uh, they can spot us coming, you know, a mile away with this haircut. And so, uh, you know, you don't stand much of a chance if you want to go out, because, you know, the, the haircut gives us away straight away, you know. It's the first thing they notice. But, uh, you know, we like it. We wouldn't change our hair just to be able to dodge the people. When you go out by yourself or in a group, yeah. do you dress in exactly the same manner as when you uh, perform or whenever I've seen you? Yeah, around? yeah, more or less. You know, we always... The only difference, I think, on, on stage we wear big high heels, boots, Cuban heels, and the boots we've got for off stage, they're sort of the same, except the heels are a bit shorter. And, uh, but generally we wear the same sort of stuff. Uh, George, do you have any, you personally, do you have any uh, special outs, uh, uh, ambitions outside of uh, being a member of the world's top recording group? No, well, um, if you'd have asked me that question nine months ago, well, I would have been able to say, you know, to sort of to come to America to have a number one hit in America and to play Carnegie Hall, to play the Palladium, to play in front of the Queen and all that, you know. I mean, in fact, the things we've done, you know, they were our ambitions, say, nine months ago. But, you know, everything sort of happened all at once. But now, you know, at the moment, you know, we can't really think of anything that we'd like to do. But we will do. I think um, we're looking forward to making the film. That's a good ambition, you know, to make a couple of films. This is a heck of an age to be a husband, is isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? You, you've had it all already. Well, I, I, by a husband, I, I don't mean that you're... Yeah, that, yeah. But uh, all of your ambitions have pretty much been fulfilled. Yeah, but I'll, no doubt we'll get more ambitions, you know. It's just trying to think of, think of them, you know. Uh, have you contemplated or would you like to become a uh, permanent resident of the United States? I don't know. Um, well, actually, you know, I love the States, uh, but... The thing that would happen if we came to live over in the States and then, you know, everybody else would go mad. You know, the thing we've got to think of, uh, you know, we've got to appear in England and we've yet to go to Australia, New Zealand, there's all sorts of places, South Africa and everywhere, where our records are all selling, you know. So we couldn't really afford to just stay in one place, you know, and it would be unfair to all the other people. <laughs> yes. Well, you know what I mean. It no, no, I do, I do, as a matter of fact. Yeah, it'd be like, say, Elvis, if he went to, say, Australia and then suddenly decided to live there, and what would all the American people and or all his fans and, you know, everybody else think? So, you know, what we're going to do is try and get round and see everybody, and, you know, no doubt we'll end up coming back to the States later on in the year, you know, because we like it so much and everybody's, you know, a gas. Right. Incidentally, except for uh, Johnny Lennon or Jack, what, what do you call John. him, Jack or John? John. John Lennon, all of you are single. Are you engaged or planning to become engaged or married? No, or? no. None, None of us are engaged. Just John's married and that's it. <laughs> and he doesn't want to get engaged either? No. Do, do you have a double, triple or quadruple date with the other fellas? How do you mean? Uh, do you get together when you have a date? And uh, yeah, uh, John so goes out with his wife. Do, do you yeah, get to get... Yeah, quite often, you know, whenever we do, get the chance to go out. But, um, you know, usually, like in England, when we do get the chance of a day off, then John will go home to his wife, and Ringo, Paul and I will go running around getting dates with, you know, girls, and we just sort of split up for the day. Uh -huh. Uh, do, do you have any uh, specific kind of girl in mind, you know, the girl that I marry? No, not really. It's hard to say, you know, I mean, one, about, say, a year ago, we all sort of liked blondes more than, say, brunettes, but, you know, that's stupid, really, because, I mean, it, it depends entirely on the girl herself. And you they're know, only a bottle apart, anyway. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're all great. You, you know, it'll, the, the ones who we'll probably marry will just sort of have something special for us, you know, that we think a bit more than the others, but, you know, you can't really say what sort of girl you're going to marry. That, that, that sounds like a very right attitude. Well, you know, I mean, they're all great, aren't they? Let's face it. Outside of singing together, are the uh, four of you close friends? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I've, I've known Paul since uh, school. About I've known him about eight or nine years now, and I've known John about seven or eight, and Ringo about four. And you know, we usually take a holiday together as well. That's what. That's a good thing. You know, that's one reason I think why we've been so successful because. You know, a lot of groups have been formed specially just to make records, and then they don't get on well together, and they always have rows, but, you know, we sort of never have big arguments. I don't think this is out of line. How old are you? Uh, 20. I'll yeah. be 21 in about oh. two weeks. Well, then that's, that's quite a long time to know each other. Yeah. How long have you been in show business? Um, well, we've been professionally about uh, 18 months. But we've been, before that, we were semi-professional for about another 80 months. So we've been, you know, playing and appearing at different places about three years altogether. But well, it's a fantastic success story, it really is. Yeah, we've been recording just about um, 14 months we, we, made, we made our first record. Do you think that your style of singing was influenced by any specific American uh, performers? Not by any one, but in the early days, you know, this is, say, about four or five years ago, we were influenced by the early Elvis records and Carl Perkins. Do you know him? Yes. And uh, Chuck Berry and, you know, Little Richard. All those, you know, we used to like all that sort of... And Buddy Holly, even. But, you know, there's not one person that we've sort of tried to copy. Uh, I thought I heard, uh, not really copying, but a similarity to the old Buddy Holly and the cricket sound. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, we can't see it really, you know, but there may be, you know, sort of, psychologically, we may sort of still be trying to get that sound that Buddy had, you know, but... There's not just one person, really, that we tried to model ourselves on. You know, we were influenced by all sorts of people. Uh, what do you think of American girls, and have you dated any yet? I haven't dated any yet. No, we haven't had the chance. But, you know, out of all the ones we've seen, they're great. You're <laughs> just looking at them, it's fine. Yeah. How, how do you pick the songs that you're going to record? Pardon? How, how do you pick the songs that you're going to record? Um, well, we usually, uh... Paul and John will write a couple for each session. And that's it. The Beatles came to America. They visited New York, Washington, D.C., and Miami. And they conquered the hearts of millions of American teenagers. This is Ed Rudy reporting for Radio Pulse Beat News. This is Brian Somerville, the press and publicity manager for The Beatles. I would like to thank, through you, Ed, the American um, radio and and press generally for the wonderful, very, very exciting reception we've had in America, which has um, passed all our expectations. And um, I only hope that we, we really merit and deserve the reception we've received. We really do mean it, most sincerely.